Welcome everyone. Today we are going to talk about uh, transesophageal echo for aortic valve stenosis, LVOT obstruction and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'm Jacob Moreno and we are doing this lecture for the 2019 preparation for the National Board of Echocardiography um, for our fellows at the Toronto General Hospital. Mm. So let's just start with everything. Um, disclosures, there is no disclosures. Uh, um, there is no academic conflicts. There is no financial conflicts of interest and no compensation uh, given for that talk. So objectives, we are going to divide the talk basically in, in two themes. We are going to talk about aortic valve stenosis and we are, we are going to define about uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and how can we use transesophageal echo uh, to help us uh, uh, assess those two pathologies. So, to start with, aortic stenosis. Uh, the last recommendations from the American Society of ECHO um, were from uh, 2017. This article is uh, it's, uh, actually very well written and is really recommended to understand better the lecture. So let's go there and let's just talk about uh, what is expected from us when we are assessing an aortic stenosis patient in the OR. So to start with, it's important to remember the aortic valve anatomy. Uh, that's why um, I love uh, this image of the heart uh, from the top of the heart, uh, removing the atriums. On the right side of the screen, we can see the cuspid valve. On the left side of the screen, we can see the mitral valve. Um, the anterior uh, to both uh, ventricles, you always uh, will have the aorta and the pulmonic. So the aorta is actually going to help us to orient it ourselves uh, with uh, TE because it's always going to be anterior to the tricuspid and the mitral. Other structures that can actually help us to get better orientation is the coronary sinus and the left atrial appendix. So when we want to assess the anatomy of the aortic valve, the first plane that is going to come to our mind is going to be the mid-esophageal aortic valve thoraxis. It's normally obtained at 45 degrees, as we can see in the picture on the left part of the screen. And then the important part here is to differentiate the leaflets. Uh, an important thing that is going to help us to differentiate which leaflets are we talking about uh, from the aortic valve is going to be the intraatrial septum between the left atrium and the right atrium, as you can see in the picture. The leaflet that is associated with the intraatrial septum is going to be the non-coronary cusp because there is, an, a no, there is no coronary artery here. So the right coronary cusp is always going to be in relationship with the uh, right ventricle and the left coronary cusp uh, where we can in fact see the origin of the left main in the picture. It's uh, going to be uh, closer to the closer to the left, uh, to, closer to the to the right side of the screen. So if we increase our angle in uh, TE and we achieve the mid-esophageal aortic valve axis at 120, 130 degrees, then that's the image that we are going to obtain. And that's the image that we are going to use to measure the annulus and measure the LVOT diameter on the aortic valve. Okay, so in this image, uh, the classical thing that we are going to find is the right coronary cusp attached to the right ventricle and the one that is attached to the anterior uh, mitral valve leaflet is going to be the non or the left coronary cusp, as you can see in the cut. Uh, the higher your angle, the higher the possibility that you are cutting through the left coronary cusp, the lower your angle, the higher the possibility you are uh, cutting through the non coronary cusp. Okay, anatomy. Here we have uh, three good examples. Uh, again, we are talking about those two planes. Recommendations of the anatomy by the American Society of Echo Guidelines are the parasternal long axis and short axis view on trans uh, thoracic echocardiography. So in transesophageal, the parasternal long axis is going to be equivalent to your um, midesophageal or valve long axis. Okay, the recommendation is to use zoom mode to get a better impression of the valve. And then here we are going to actually assess the number of cusps in systole because it's when they are open. And if there is a raffi present or not, uh, you want to assess the mobility and you want to assess the degree of calcification. So <clears throat> as we were saying uh, for us in TE, uh, our aortic valve long axis is going to be the equivalent to 
to the trans traffic. Uh, again, remember the leaflet in the long axis view that is attached to the right ventricle is going to be your right coronary cusp. The leaflet that is attached to the left atrium is going to be the non coronary cusp or the left coronary cusp. Okay, and then here on the right side of the screen you are going to have the aortic valve short axis and we have the different structures that they are going to help us the left coronary cusp the non coronary cusp in between the right and the left atrium and the right coronary cusp over there okay aortic stenosis etiology so there is different etiologies that will cause aortic stenosis. The, one of the most common ones is the fact of uh, having a uh, calcification of the, of the aortic valve and uh, congenital, which the most frequent type of congenital is going to be the bicuspid. There is some rheumatic disease of the aortic valve, but it's not as frequent in North America, the fact of finding rheumatic disease. So basically the acquired type is the one that is going to be divided in rheumatic and calcified and then we are going to talk a little bit about those. So first of all when you have a, a rheumatic aortic stenosis you should look for a triangular systolic orifice in, uh, in the opening on systole on the leaflets of the aortic valve. While when we are talking about the calcification uh, valve, you should look for a nestelate shape uh, systolic orifice. Um, when we are talking about congenital, uh, the classical valve that we're going to find is the bicuspid. The most common cause of bicuspid aortic valve is going to be um, uh, is going to appear as a raphe between the left and the non coronary cusp. And we are going to talk in a second of uh, how we can differentiate that. But you can see, in fact, other kinds of uh, congenital disease on the aortic valve that will cause aortic stenosis as unicuspid aortic valve or quadricuspid aortic valve. Uh, and you can actually see the images of those here. So the congenital uh, type, when we talk about bicuspid aortic valve, as you can see per Schaefer et al. in 2008, the public is that the type 1, which is the most frequent type, is the fusion of the right and the, and the left uh, coronary cusp. And in 60% of the cases of this type, there is a raphe in between them. But there is 20 that they don't present a raphe. So, like around almost uh, like a 10% of the between a, a between 10-20% uh, you can see the fusion of the right and the non coronary cusp and it's extremely rare to appreciate a type 3 which is the, the left coronary cusp and the non coronary cusp. So in Europe and United States of America, so the aortic valve replacements performed for aortic stenosis, 50% of them are due to bicuspid, bicuspid aortic valves. Okay, so diagnostic, we have uh, two, ca two cusps seen in systole and we have the elliptical systolic orifice as we previously mentioned. And here, as you can see, that's the anatomy that we expect to see and that, that's where we are going to see the raphe in a type 1 or a right to left coronary cusp fusion with rough in the middle and the blue area is the opening area of the aortic valve. Okay, so here's an example of a bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, on the left side of the screen, we're using a 3D technology called an X-Plane. This is from Philips. And uh, <clears throat> there are like, depending on the platform that you can use, you have the multiplane uh, from GE and you can actually do the same in, in Siemens, okay? So what it does is it cuts uh, in the long axis view of the aortic valve, you get a parallel plane that is going to be with a difference of 90 degrees, okay? And on the right side of the screen, we can see the same bicuspid aortic valve in the short axis. Okay, so using 3D, you can see that with a much better appreciation. 
and you can perfectly see in that picture the Rafi coming into the image between the right and the left coronary cusp. So, as per the American Society of Echo, echocardiography is the primary uh, non-invasive imaging method for valve anastenosis. Uh, it's the key tool for the diagnosis and evaluation, and it's uh, really important in clinical decision making. Um, we are going to assess uh, aortic stenosis with uh, TE based on three levels of a standard clinical practice. We are going to base this lecture on the level one and level two, and we are not going to talk about the level three, which is not recommended routinely. The level one is the most used one, and it's appropriate and recommended, and the level two is when there is a reasonable uh, in selected in very specific patients. So, starting with the recommendations as level one, you are going to need to remember that the way to assess an aortic stenosis is going to start always with uh, the jet velocity on the aortic stenosis. After that, you want to calculate the mean transaortic gradient, and we are talking about mean, which will be different when you are assessing a hypertrophic heart and a in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? And the valve area by continuity equation, and we will explain during this lecture how to obtain that. As a level two, which is an alternate way of doing things for a specific patients, you can simplify the continuity equation to calculate your uh, valve area, or you can use the velocity ratio or the aortic valve area by planimetry. And as the experimental um, things that can be done to actually see aortic uh, stenosis, they are they are here. As you can see, as uh, LV percentage of stroke work loss, recover pressure gradient, energy loss, uh, impedance, uh, resistance, or projected ABA. But those are subjects for another lecture. So let's just start. How do we quantify the severity of aortic stenosis? So uh, the main criteriums that uh, the guidelines recommend us is starting with the peak velocity, because the peak velocity is the one that is going to give you the mean gradient, and we are going to explain that in a moment. And what do you, you need to remember is a peak velocity of more than 4 is considered severe, and the normal values are going to be below 2.5 meters per second. The mean gradients, it's more than 40 when it's severe, and it's less than 20 when it's um, mild. For aortic valve area in centimeters to the square, it's minus the minus the, uh, below one centimeter to the square. You're considering that as severe aortic stenosis, and mild is going to be when it's going to be more than 1.5. You can do the indexed aortic valve area when you have very small patients or very big patients. And then they are talking about uh, severe aortic stenosis when it's below uh, 0.6 and the velocity ratio. And we will explain that in a second. When it's uh, below 0.25, it's when it's considered severe aortic stenosis. There are some interesting conclusions from the key points. Uh, and this just came straight from the, from the guidelines. And they talk about... Uh, it's very important for the aortic stenosis peak jet velocity to be obtained in multiple views. And that's the recommendation, okay? Not, not basing your study in a single measurement. It's extremely recommended to have a, a dedicated uh, dual crystal of continuous with Doppler transducer. And again, this is, this is going to be done by the machine. But the mean gradient should be calculated, averaging the instantaneous gradients over the ejection uh, period, and no basic uh, and not obtain it from the velocity, okay, from the mean velocity. So, as an important source of error, the LBOT diameter. The recommendation is to measure in transthoracic echocardiography in the parasternal long axis. So we should measure it in the mid-esophageal long axis view of the aortic valve when we are using TE. And as per guidelines, it should be between 0.3 centimeters to 1 centimeters away from the annulus and in mid-systole from inner edge to inner edge of the septal endocardium. And that's really important. The same thing will be applied for the aortic annulus. Okay, so... And... Exactly at this level is where you are going to position your pulse weight Doppler to obtain your LBOT Doppler profile.
Okay, so those are really important things when we are assessing aortic uh, stenosis. So the direct planimetry of the LBOT to be more accurate and not assume any uh, geometrical shape in the LBOT can be done by 3DTE with multiplane reconstruction or can be done by um, CT scan uh, to try to avoid the source, uh, the, the source of error. So let's just go a little bit more deep into that and let's talk about what we are going to be doing. Okay, so valve anatomy, uh, when we are quantifying aortic stenosis, we have already talked about how to do it. And then the important part that we are going to discuss next on the lecture is going to be the LBOT diameter, the LBOT velocity, and the AS jet velocity. And how are we going to be able to uh, calculate and obtain those? So let's just start with LBOT diameter. As we were saying before, it should be measured 0.3 to 1 centimeter away from the or below the aortic uh, valve orifice. Okay, and as you can see in the picture, this is recommended to be done in the parasternal long axis. So the equivalent to that in TE will be the aortic valve long axis. Should be from inner edge to inner edge in mid systole. Okay, and it's important. It's recommended to use zoom mode to get a better a better definition of it and even adjust the gain to optimize the, the blood tissue interface. LVOT diameter is a big source of error, so it's extremely important to do it properly, otherwise we are not going to be able to get the aortic valve area in an accurate manner. So if we keep going, another option that we can do to actually try to avoid the try to avoid those mistakes when we are measuring the LVOT, the, LV, the, LVOT, the LVOT diameter is go straight and calculate the LVOT area. So first of all, things that we can do to do that. So if uh, we measure an LVOT diameter, which in this example is 2.3 centimeters, we are calculating an aortic valve area of 1.3, which it will make the aortic valve area it will make the aortic stenosis as moderate. But the problem that we have with that is that we don't know if we are cutting the LVOT where we should be cutting. So one thing that we can do is we can take a 3D picture image from here, we can align the planes, and then we can, after doing that, we can measure the diameter, being sure that you are cutting the LVOT where it should be cut, because you can have actually a proper alignment with multiplane reconstruction using 3D. And then we realize that the real LVOT diameter is 2.02 centimeters compared to the 2.3 centimeters that we were getting. So our value in the Arctic valve area is going to be different. Okay, and even more, you can actually use that to calculate the LVOT area directly and not assuming that the LVOT is going to be a perfect circle and doing it, uh, doing pi per radius to the square in the equation to be able to actually obtain your, your LVOT area. So we have talked about how to detect, um, how to calculate uh, and how to do the LVOT diameter. Now we are going to talk about how to obtain LVOT velocities, okay? So for the LVOT velocities, the first recommended way of doing that is using, uh, instead of continuous width Doppler, pulse width Doppler, because it's more accurate than continuous width Doppler. And the Doppler sample should be, uh, should be done um, at the level of the LVOT, as, as where we were measuring the diameter of the LVOT. So to get that, the recommendation as per the guidelines is from the apical long axis view or the five chamber view, which in TE is going to be equivalent to the T deep transgastric or the transgastric long axis. So the deep transgastric, we have an example here. You can see the morphology, and that's the way. It's very important to align the plane. 
and for the transgastric long axis uh, in T is not so easy to align the plane and normally uh, we are not going to get like such a good alignment as in the deep transgastric but it's another source of uh, possibility to measure the LVOT. So what you're going to do is you put your push weight doper at the level of the LVOT you, and you trace and then you trace the and then you trace the the doppler shape that you are getting and automatically the machine is going to calculate your maximum velocity and your your mean and your max peak gradient and the VDI of the LVOT okay which is the velocity timing integral which is the conjunction of the momentus that are inside of the of the area of the doppler so it's recommended again to be done with a sweep uh, speed of between 50 and 100 millimeters per second as you can see in the white arrow here so we have done we have done the LVOT diameter we have done the LVOT VTI now we need to calculate the aortic uh, the aortic stenosis jet velocity the problem with the aortic stenosis jet velocity is that we are not going to be able to calculate that with pulse width doppler because we are going to have an aliasing effect so you need to use uh, a continuous width doppler and it's recommended by the ASA uh, the ASC um, to actually have a dedicated transducer for that. So in this example, uh, we are taking that from the deep transgastric view in TEE, and then you put your continuous wet Doppler in the middle of the valve, and then you just pulse. And then you trace the BTI from the outer edge of the tensile signal. And then automatically the machine is going to calculate for you your Vmax and your mean uh, gradients. And if you have actually placed uh, before the LVOT diameter and the LVOT VTI, the RT valve area is going to be calculated as in this example. The advantages of this technique are going to be the possibility of doing a direct measurement of the velocity. And this jet velocity is the strongest predictor of clinical outcome. So we are going to talk a little bit at the end of the lecture about this uh, critical outcome but definitely anything about 5.5 is going to have severe uh, implications for the patients the limitation of this uh, jet velocity is i think the most important one is that it's flow dependent so if the velocity is flow dependent the gradients are going to be flow dependent because the gradients are calculated from the velocity and it's extremely important to do a correct uh, measurements with a parallel alignment of the ultrasound beam. And as we were mentioning before, in the long axis view of the transgastric plane for TE, this uh, alignment is not really good. So if you can't get a deep transgastric view, uh, it's going to be complicated to get uh, to get normal normal values. So, okay, so we have the LVOT diameter, we have the LVOT VTI, and we have the AS uh, jet velocity. So how are those mean transaortic pressure gradients calculated? We were talking the whole time that from velocities we can actually get the mean transaortic gradients. So to actually be able to get those, you are going to need the Bernoulli equation. That's how the machine, the software of the machine calculates it. So the Bernoulli equation is going to compare a difference in pressure is going to be uh, equal to connect, uh, convective acceleration, flow acceleration, and viscose friction. Consider, con, considering a constant, the viscose friction of the blood, and having in account the, the same flow acceleration, so you can simplify this equation as the maximum or peak gradient being equal to 4 per v to the square so that's how the machine does it so the machine calculates the maximum velocity on the doppler and 4 per this velocity to the square is going to give you the maximum or peak gradient but there is a problem with this formula 
because in this formula we are simplifying the proximal and the distal velocity. When we talk about the proximal velocity, we are talking about the velocity in the LVOT and the distal velocity is the velocity in the Arctic valve. So the exception where we cannot use this simplify equation is when your LVOT velocity is more than 1.5 meters per second or when the Arctic velocity is less than 3 meters per second. Then you need to use the modify Bernoulli equation which, we, which is the maximum or peak gradient is going to be equal to 4 per the b max to the square minus the b proximal to the square okay being the b max the maximum velocity in the arctic valve and the b proximal the maximum velocity in the ldot if you want to understand this better try to remember that whenever the ldot velocity is one meter per second or less and a square number uh, like a number that is one below one which we a square is actually smaller so it's very minimal the effect that is going to have in the maximum or peak gradient then that's the way of calculating the maximum gradient so how do we calculate the mean gradient so that's something that the machine is going to do with the software and the machine is going to do an average of the instantaneous mean gradients over the ejection period another way to calculate it is doing 2.4 per the Vmax to the square, but that's actually not recommended as per the ASC. What we should go is by the average of instantaneous mean gradients. So now that we know where to measure and how to measure, how do we get the Arctic valve area? So we will be able to get the velocity and the mean gradients, which is a level one. Uh, for assessment of aortic stenosis. Another level one is to calculate the aortic valve area based on the continuity equation. So what's the continuity equation? The, continuous, the, the continuity equation establishes that the stroke volume in the LVOT should be equal to the stroke volume in the aortic valve. And the stroke volume, volume can be calculated by the cross-sectional area per the BDI or velocity time integral. Remember, the cross-sectional area, the units, are going to be centimeters to the square, the VTI, centimeters. Centimeters to the square per centimeters, centimeters to the cube, which equals milliliters. And that's how you get your stroke volume. So what we are going to do is very simple. We are going to say the aortic valve area per the VTI of the aortic valve area, which is the stroke volume in the aortic valve, should be equal to the cross-sectional area of the LVOT per the VTI on the LVOT. Assuming that the BTI of the aortic valve area can be calculated by continuous width Doppler in the deep transcastle view. The BTI of the LVOT can be calculated by pulse, by pulse width Doppler per the BTI in the LVOT. And the cross section area of the LVOT is going to be calculated, assuming that the LVOT is a circle, by you want to know the area, so it's the perimeter. So it's going to be pi per radius to the square. So if you know the diameter, you divide the diameter by two and you get the radius. And that's how you get the cross sectional area in the LVOT. A uh, very important point here. Thank you to the 3D technology. Uh, we know now that the LVOT is actually not circular, it's more ellipsoid. So if you have the capacity of doing 3D and multiplane reconstruction and get an LVOT area, this measurement is going to be much more accurate than only the LVOT diameter. Or at least getting the LVOT diameter by 3D is going to help you uh, and not do so, so, so much mistake that if you choose use 2D. Advantages of this uh, article are very calculated by continuity equation. It's flow independent compared to the velocities and the mean gradients, which are flow dependent. It's helpful when the flows are very low or very high, because those can have like an implication in the mean gradients. Very high flows are going to give you high velocities, high gradients, very low flows are going to give you low velocity, low gradients, okay? Doppler velocity and pressure gradients are flow dependent for an orifice area. So that's what you need to bring home, okay? So the limitations of this equation is normally it's been observed that the effective 
valve area is going to be a little bit smaller than the real anatomic valve area when you are, when you measure it from the surgeons okay and the changes in flow rate are going to give you changes in the valve area so if you go brady or if you go if you go tachycardic that might change and affect your aortic valve area by continuity equation and remember in those patients that they have severe LV dysfunction or they have an LVAD because the opening of the aortic valve is not constant or is very minimal so those are the ones that are going to to give you like significant changes on the valve area with every single bit because it's going to be different so the double envelope technique i wanted to comment on that because i say that some people prefer this technique some people prefer to measure lbot bti by push with doppler in the lbot and then uh, do continuous with doppler and measure the aortic valve uh, bti by continuous with doppler there so the advantages of using this technique is that you can simultaneously obtain the left ventricle outflow track and aortic valve velocities in a single bit in the same bit that's good but the problem is measuring the lbot bti which is the b1 represented in the picture here when you use continuous with Doppler, it's not as accurate as when you use pulse with Doppler. So it tends to overestimate the peak. So you're going to overestimate the aortic valve area. You can use it, but remember that the values here are going to be a little bit higher than the values if you use pulse with Doppler in the LBOT and you measure the LBOT VTI by the pulse with Doppler. So now we are more comfortable with the methods that we use to assess aortic stenosis by uh, level level one so we are going to keep going and we are going to talk a little bit about the methods that we use in the level two so simplify continuity equation so basically it's the continuity equation as it is but instead of using the vti that you need to trace the whole area of uh, of the doppler signal you are going to convert that into velocity being v the maximum velocity so you just measure the maximum velocity in the lvot and the maximum velocity in the aortic valve and you use the aortic valve area to calculate your aortic valve the advantage of that is that it's faster to do but it's less accurate especially when there is an atypical shape of the doppler uh, and on the curve So another thing is the dimension, another method that we can use, which is a level two recommendation, is the dimensions, dimensionless uh, index, or also known as velocity ratio. So it's an even more simplified Bernoulli, uh, equation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, even more simplified continuity equation. Okay, so what we do here is literally, just compare the velocity in the LVOT divided by the velocity in the aortic valve. So the usual scenario is the velocity should be pretty close one to the other. So when the velocity in the LVOT is less than 25% of the velocity in the aortic valve, that means that the aortic valve is severely stenotic. So when the dimensionless index is below equal or below 0.25, that's an indicator of severe aortic stenosis and it's an effective aortic valve area expressed as a proportion of the LVOT cross-sectional area. So the third and uh, final uh, level two method to assess aortic stenosis is the aortic valve area by planimetry. So the, the main problem that you are going to find when you use the planimetry here is specifically when you have such a calcified a calcify area. So you're going to have um, a normal aortic valve area is going to be between 0.6, uh, 2.6 and 3.2 centimeters to the square. And it's a good technique if you are not able to get an unreliable Doppler estimation of flow velocities. You can get a deep transgastric, there is contraindication to go with the T in the transgastric. So you basically are not going to be able to get the Doppler. So you're not going to be able to get velocities, gradients, and you're not going to be able to calculate the aortic valve area based on that. So you can do that and you can, you don't know how to use 3D, then this is a, a good alternative. So it's inaccurate, specifically when the calcifications 
give you shadows and reverberations and what is a limitation because and the limitation of uh, actually identifying the the orifice so you want to perfectly see in systole the three leaflets you can use color doppler to narrow to narrow to to get the narrowest office and you can reduce the gain to avoid the blooming to avoid the blooming from from the calcium Another way is you go to parasternal long axis, or in our case, we go to the long axis of the Arctic valve. So you do, you do like a M mole crossing, crossing through the, through the annulus of the Arctic valve, and you can see the separation in systole of the casps. And what we know is anything below eight millimeters is associated with an Arctic valve area or of uh, minus one centimeter to the square. Those two techniques are very well described in the book of uh, Perrino and colleagues. And remember, when we are doing a, a planimetry of the aortic valve, uh, changes in the cardiac output doesn't mean changes in the planimetric aortic valve area. So it's not affected by flow as, as uh, the gradients and the velocities are. So we have a couple of discrepancies when we are measuring aortic stenosis and there are three scenarios that is worthy to mention. The first one is when you have low flow and low gradient aortic stenosis and we will explain what's that and you have preserve or decrease EF which is going to change how do we assess this AS. And then a third and interesting scenario is the one where you have a normal flow but you have low gradient and you have an aortic valve area that is less than one centimeter to the square with preserved EF, which makes no sense. So we will talk about the three of them and what can be happening when we got those scenarios. So the new guidelines from the American Heart Association uh, divided aortic stenosis in four clinical stages, A, B, C, and D. The important part here for us is the symptomatic severe aortic stenosis is the one that we are going to see in the OR and the main differentiations that we are going to do is between the D2 and D3. So D2 is the low flow, low gradient AS with impaired uh, left ventricle systolic function. And the D3 is the low flow, low gradient AS with normal uh, preserved uh, LVEF, which is considered more than 50%. So based on those new classifications for the American Heart Association, the recommendations from the American Society of ECHO to assess those types of um, aortic stenosis are as follow. So we have a case of low flow, that means that your stroke volume indexed for the body surface area of the patient should be less than 35 millimeters per meter to the square. You have a low gradient, and to get a low gradient means that your Bmax is less than 4, which is the, which is the cutoff to consider an aortic stenosis severe, or your mean gradient is less than 40, which is the same cutoff to be considered as severe. And you have a normal F uh, ejection fraction from the left ventricle, which is 50% or more. So in that situation, if you get an aortic valve area of less than one centimeter to the square, so why are we getting those? Uh, wha how is possible to get a severe aortic uh, valve stenosis when your velocity and your mean gradients are not matching the criterion for severe aortic stenosis? So the first thing that you need to remember is that the velocity and the gradients are flow dependent and the aortic valve area even by planimetry or even by continuous equation, they are not flow dependent. Okay, so some of the key points uh, that we got uh, uh, when we are doing that is uh, the possibility of when we are doing the measurements, the patient being like severely hypertensive during the examination or being a patient with um, left ventricle, severe left ventricle hypertrophy due to chronic hypertension and that's what is actually going to explain why the flows were low and why the gradients were low because the flows were actually low okay so it should be a situation where your flows are decreased but not because the heart can actually eject properly it's because there is something that is not allowing 
the flows to actually uh, be bigger than the specter. And those situations are normally, uh, as we mentioned, severe hypertension with severe increase in the afterload, or it can be especially like after after like a cardiopulmonary bypass in those patients when you have a patient extremely dry and you increase the okay so um, the other thing that is important to actually exclude when you are getting this kind of situation is that you didn't uh, make like a, a measure error and the most important part is going to be in the lvot area and the lvot diameter Okay, so as you can see in table five, this is the criteria uh, that increase the likely the likelihood of uh, severe AS in patients with low flow, low gradient AS, and preserved EF. So, and the recommendations that they do is uh, assess the left ventricle hypertrophy, assess uh, the severity of the of the calcium. In, in the CT to see if it's actually high, and this is more consistent with AI. So when we have that situation, okay, so we are talking about uh, low flow, uh, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis, and normal EF. So the recommendation from the guidelines is to go to an integrated uh, approach and this integrated uh, approach is uh, is the one that we were that we were just mentioning before okay so recommendation to be sure that you don't uh, uh, mess up with the calculation of the lvot diameter is to go and try to get it in 3d if you don't know how to do 3d or the 3d images were not taken you can actually go and assess it by ct or mri and then get a calcium score by the by the ct and they say that uh, if uh, immense the calcium score is more than 3000 the, there is a very likely possibility of being severe ai okay so The other situation is uh, when you get low flow, low gradient AS and decreased ejection fraction. Um, in that situation, uh, the problem is you still have low flow, so your stroke volume index is less than 35 millimeters per meter to the second. You have uh, your Vmax, which is um, uh, less than 4 meters per second, and your mean gradient less than 40 millimeters of mercury because the mean gradients are. Uh, are, are are being given uh, by the mm -hmm. Bmax, but you have an EF that is less than 50% or abnormal. You still have like a severe aortic stenosis because the aortic valve area is less than one centimeter. So when we have this uh, scenario, you need to know if this is a true severe AS or this is uh, due to LV dysfunction. So to do that, the recommendation is to do a dobutamine stress echo, and we will talk a little bit about uh, how do we do that. So when you do the vitamin stress echo, what you want to know if there is uh, a flow reserve or not. We understand flow reserve, the increase in the stroke volume up by 20%. If you are able to achieve it with the vitamin stress echo, and your aortic valve area still less than one centimeter to the square, this is known as true severe aortic stenosis. And the severe aortic stenosis means that it's real and it causes the LV, LV systolic, and, it's in, and the, the cause of that is the LV systolic dysfunction, the low flow, okay? But when you increase your stroke volume by a 20% with the vitamin stress test and the aortic valve area is more than one centimeter to the square, so that means that it's a pseudo severe aortic stenosis and the low flows are the ones that causes the velocity and the gradients to underestimate the severity of the aortic valve area due to LV dysfunction, okay? When there is a no flow reserve, you do the vitamin stress echo, you are not able to increase your stroke volume by 20%, so we cannot say it, so the recommendation is to go to the uh, calcium score by CT, and if there is uh, high enough, we are going to consider that a real aortic stenosis. 
So here's the protocol and uh, for the W administers echo, they recommend uh, to start uh, like a 2.5 to 5 mics per kilo per minute and to increase the doses between 2.5 to 5 mics every three, three to five minutes up to a maximum of 20 mics per kilo per minute. And then again, if you are able to increase your stroke volume per uh, 20%, and you are able to get a final valve area which is more than 1.0 centimeters that uh, is suggestive of uh, not being a true aortic stenosis okay so we already know the parameters for that and um, those are the the absence of a contractile reserve which means uh, failure to increase the stroke volume more than 20 percent has a high surgical mortality and poor long-term outcome despite uh, despite the the, the valve replacement may improve, may improve the lp function and outcome even in this uh, subgroup which is really interesting for the patient prognosis okay so the third scenario is is probably the more weird one uh, is when you have like normal flow but uh, with normal flow, you, you have low gradients, you have an aortic valve area that is less than one centimeters to the square, and you have a normal ejection fraction. So how having a normal ejection fraction with a normal flow, you are getting a severe aortic stenosis on your area, but your gradients doesn't, they don't match the, the aortic valve area. So in this case, the most possible scenario is that you are making a mistake uh, and you are making an underestimation of the LVOT area. Or again, the same situation that we were mentioning before, you are doing the study with severe hypertension and this is what is going to give you like an inconsistency in the, in the inconsistency in the values. That's why in those cases, when you have like um, low gradient AS with uh, preserved EF, um, you need to... To assess your stroke volume and if it's normal you most likely are doing an error of measurement of the LVOT area. So prognostic markers. Uh, there are several predictors of uh, symptom development but I think what we really need to know and the implications for us is like uh, in clinical practice uh, the guidelines that actually impact the decision for surgery in asymptomatic AS is going to be a peak velocity of more than 5.5, an increase uh, in the peak transvalvular velocity of more than 0.3 meters per second per year, and an increase in the mean pressure gradient with exercise by 20 millimeters of mercury. So with all the information, surgical approach, uh, on the left side, a uh, hand of the screen, we can see why we need to operate, and as you can see, the survival rate goes really low once you have uh, when you start to have severe symptoms and that's why the American Heart Association is recommending any severe AS by echocardiography parameters which is symptomatic is a class 1 indication for going for surgery and the other thing that you might have in account is that uh, when you have an asymptomatic patient but you have a low EF or a maximum velocity of more than 5 is uh, is actually or you have another um, indication for cardiac surgery is another th uh, another good reason for for actually considering uh, valve replacement okay so here's the first uh, part of the talk i think we need to do a little break now take a breath uh, and just relax a little bit and chill a little bit out and then uh, we will start with um, the hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy.